Let's go with him. Heavenly Father, thank you for all the gifts you've bestowed on the church. Thank you for all the people, the friends that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to get together tonight to study your word. Please let it bless our hearts so that we can take it out into the world and show it to everyone. The country is in a crisis now, both morally and physically, and it can only heal through your touch and your, your intervention. You need to help guide people to do what's right and understand there is absolute right, not just ambiguous morals. And we thank you for tonight. We ask for blessings on uh, us as we read your word, we study it, we understand it. And for the kids down below at our Word of Life, they're meeting and growing quite a bit. And with that, we ask it all in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Amen. With that, we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the apostles. Um, in Luke chapter 6, we find the names of the original 12 apostles. Um, Luke chapter 6, verses 13 through 16, give us their name and some of their background, a little bit. Uh, it's in uh, all the Gospels, but Luke is a little more detailed than some of the other ones. He was a physician, as you know, and a lot of his writing that the Holy Spirit used his ability to be detailed, almost historical accounts of things, uh, which gives it a little different view than the other apostles. And, and that was intentional. I mean, all the apostles had their own views and backgrounds, so when God used them, he used their talents to, to write the Gospels. So Luke 6, starting in verse 13, and one day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, who he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas, the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. So that's the original 12 apostles, but that's not the end of the story. Interestingly, there were actually 14 apostles total. You had the original 12, then after Judas betrayed uh, Christ, he was replaced by Matthias. And then later on, Paul was struck by Christ and spent three years in... Uh, the Arabian Desert, learning from him after the resurrection, and he became the 14th apostle. So there were a total of 14, which I find intriguing because there are also 14 tribes of Israel. You never find more than 12 at a time in a single list, but if you put all the names of the tribes together and figure out the individual tribes listed, there were 14 of them. So that, that simile... I don't know exactly what it is, but it's always interesting when you see all these balances God has where there's 14 of this and 14 of that. Or It's just always very interesting. He has a miraculous way of making things inspire people. So, Of the apostles, three of them were closer to Jesus than anyone else. Uh, Peter, James, and John. And they were the earliest, some of the earliest ones to be uh, called. And uh, the Bible doesn't really go into why he chose them as his inner circle. But it is clear throughout all the Gospels in that he's, he's grooming them to be leaders in the church. Uh, not just... I mean, all the apostles were sent out to spread the word. These three were groomed to be even more of a leader than the rest of them. Uh, they were included in a lot of uh, different events in Jesus' life that the other apostles weren't. They were witnesses to the transfiguration. They were there when Jesus raised uh, Jairus' daughter from the dead. Um, 
during the uh, prayers in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, they had a special place, especially Peter, because Christ, although all the apostles fell asleep, Christ went to Peter specifically and talked to him about staying awake and praying during that period. So we're going to take a look tonight at Peter a little bit. And, you know, we only have about four hours, so it's going to be quick. No, I'm just kidding. We have about 20 minutes. But it's going to be a couple of key points um, of Peter during uh, Christ's ministry and then also after it. Uh, we're going to look uh, briefly at his calling, the two significant events that he was at, the transfiguration, and then Peter's denial, which has a lot of things it can teach us. And I'm sure that's why God put it in there. And finally, uh, look at uh, how Peter passed. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us specifically how he died. There's some uh, prophecy we're going to look at that Christ told him on how he's going to die. But his death is really from church history, not biblical. So it's not uh, don't, don't take it to the bank as gospel, so to speak. Uh, because it's not in the Bible, we don't know for sure, but we can look at the prophecy that gives us an idea that it's probably right. So before we even do that, the question that I thought of is why, why do we want to study the apostles at all? And there's two good points we want to pull from our study of apostles. The first is they were the 12 that were chosen, or the 14 total, but the first 12 that were chosen by Christ and sent out to spread the news, the gospel, the good news. In fact, the apostle means just that, one who is sent out. So they were tasked to bring Christ's message to the world. And if God picks someone to do something... I'm going to look at him and try to learn from him because there's probably something special about him because God chose him. And then also the apostles we're going to see were just men. They had flaws, they made mistakes, and we can learn from that because even though they had mistakes that they made, God chose them to be the apostles and he knew that in the end they would overcome the stuff, the mistakes. They would overcome their problems and they would do what he needed done for his glory. So Peter and his brother Andrew were the first apostles called by Jesus. Peter's calling is covered in all three of the Gospels. And as a side note, it's interesting. The three Gospels, as I said earlier, have a different view on the world, each of them. Uh, Matthew, it's a book uh, written by a Jewish person for the Jewish community. It stresses the prophecies in the Old Testament about Christ. And he draws a picture of Christ from that. Mark is often called the hurry up gospel. He uses the word straight away quite a bit. Um, it's brief to the point and it shows the emphasis or the expediency in Christ's life because he only had three years for his ministry on earth from the start to the finish when he assumed his role till he was crucified. So during that period, um, Mark shows the urgency that Christ had to, to go from one activity or event to another. And then, as I mentioned earlier, Luke is the doctor in the group. He, the Holy Spirit used him to write a historical account. John is also a totally different view on the world. It's not in the same category. The first three are what they call synoptic gospels or synchronized. They, they go together. They talk about the story of Christ's life. John is different in that it's not. It doesn't go into his life in that type of detail as though it's uh, a historical account going through what happened. It focuses more on the miraculous side of Christ. So if we look at Luke chapter 5, verse 1 we'll start at, we have the calling of Peter by Christ. And I, I don't have too many 
verses, but I tried to keep them in Luke so that we're sort of looking in the same area for everything. So Luke chapter 5, verse 1. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he, Jesus, sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. So Jesus right away was recognized by Peter as being God. I mean, he, he showed a miracle, but there were people claiming to do miracles. They weren't true at that point, but there were other people out there claiming to do miracles. And he actually did something that Peter saw and recognized him. And, and he just gave everything up. I mean, they owned a fishing business. It's not like they were... Um, laborers for someone else who just show up for the day and you know he doesn't stand out in front of Home Depot and get odd work for the day he had a fishing business with a boat and everything it was the family business but he gave it all up because he wanted to go with Christ he saw what he was looking for Christ made up an inner circle of his apostles with Peter, James, and John. And those three, as I mentioned, were with Christ many times when the others weren't. And they spoke with him often and got more detailed answers from Christ than the public got or the other apostles got. In Luke 9, we have the account of uh, the transfiguration. And... Um, it's really interesting to see what he gets from it. So in Luke chapter 9, starting at verse 28, Now about days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered. And in fact, um, the word here for altar according to um, uh, word pictures by uh, A.T. Robertson, is actually the root that was eventually used as the word metamorphosis in English. So it's not like he put makeup on or anything like that. When they say his face was altered, it just changed um, like a butterfly coming out of a cocoon. I mean, all of a sudden, he opened up. He metamorphed, metamorphosized, I guess, into uh, his glory. The appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him 
Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. So what are we learning from the transfiguration? God puts everything in the Bible for a reason. It's his inspired word. It's to teach us. It's to correct us. It's to make us better. So what are we learning from this? Well, there's three major points that point to God's divin- or Jesus' divinity. Um, first, his earthly body was glorified at that point. It metamorphosized into a body that was obviously divine. To the, Jew- to the Jewish audience, the appearance of Elijah and Moses was supporting Christ's role as the Messiah. They pointed to him as the fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament. And then, of course, the booming voice of God the Father, declaring Christ to be his Son. Those three points are key to us to understand that he really is God. I mean, there is no question of that. He is the Messiah. Later on, a lot happened you know the stories, and they have the Last Supper. And then after the Last Supper, they go to pray in the garden. After they prayed in the garden, Peter tried to blend in with the community around them. He was afraid. And we're going to look a little more at that and and how he got into it. But he was afraid, and he denied Christ three times. And this was foretold by Christ during the Last Supper. And this is an account that appears in all four Gospels, which makes it significant, because a lot of them appear in two or three, but to have an account of an event that appeared in all four of them, God is putting an exclamation point there for us to say, you guys, this is telling you something. That's why it's there. I mean, all of God's Word tells us something, but... By putting it in all four of them, it puts an emphasis on the importance of this event. So what does the denial actually say? If we look at Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 55, we'll see the account of Peter's denial. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You also are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, Certainly, This man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And the Lord turned and looked at Peter, and Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, How he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. So, what are we trying to be taught, since this is so important and it's in all four Gospels, what is God teaching us about Peter's denial? Well, the first one goes down to the fact that 
Peter wasn't prepared for the denial, or for the, for the, for the attacks he would receive for being one of the apostles. Um, in John 15, and, and I'll read it, we don't have to turn if you don't want. In John 15, in verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So Peter wasn't prepared to face the ridicule and persecution that Jesus was facing at this point. He had already been taken away from the garden by the uh, temple gods. And Peter wasn't prepared for the persecution he would continue to face for being part of uh, Jesus' dis disciples, uh, apostles. But the good point here for Peter is that he remained loyal. Many of the other apostles fled and didn't come back. Throughout the accounts that come, as Christ is, um, is uh, put before court, put before Pilate, he walks the cross down the road. Through all this, Peter stays at a distance, but he's still there. So he's afraid, but he's trying to overcome it. And, and we're all... We're all natural people. We're, we're, uh, we were created in the world. We don't have our glorified bodies yet. So to be afraid is something that we need to deal with. But what we're being taught is that you continue to try it anyway. You're going to make mistakes. He was still chosen by Christ. And just keep pushing on, working through your mistake. If you deny him like Peter did and then he realized, which is probably why he wept, he realized what he did, um, he kept pushing on anyway and he stayed, although at a distance, he stayed with Christ to see and witness what was being done. The other reason or the other item that we're being taught is that you need to be prepared. We're going to face, as Christians, we're going to face a lot of persecution ourselves. Not as much right now as other countries, but some of the Christians in China or in the uh, Baltic states, they, they actually have to face the possibility of death every day for their faith. So we need to be prepared. And how are we prepared? If we look at Again, this is going to be outside of Luke, so you don't have to turn to it. I'll read it to you. If we look at Matthew uh, chapter 26, verses 40 and 41. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. This is taking place in the garden of Geth the Gethsemane. I have to excuse me, my mouth is very dry tonight. Um, so this takes place while Christ is praying in private, and he had asked the apostles to pray. Uh, as well. And he comes back and he finds them all asleep. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. What God is teaching us here is that how do we prepare for something that we know our bodies or our human mortal minds can't handle? Like Peter, the fear of persecution. How do we deal with it? Well, we deal with it through prayer. We pray to God and ask him to support us because we can't do it ourselves. Our bodies are weak and we're going to fail if we try to do it ourselves. So we have to trust in God and pray for his support. And that's one of the reasons prayer is so important is that we need to turn to God, and this way he knows we're turning to him to thank him, to ask for his support, and we may be able to get through it. Peter slept. He didn't get the prayer in that Christ had asked him to. So it's possible 
he didn't have the full support because of that. You know, Christ had asked him to pray, and he couldn't do it in his mortal body. So he was afraid later on. If he had spent the time praying, maybe God would have allowed him not to deny Christ. Of course, then he wouldn't have had the prophecy because Christ knew what was going to happen. But it's just one of the things that we could take from this. Is that second thing he's trying to teach us is that we need to pray to God for our support, not look on to ourselves. And the last thing this story tells us is that if we're doing God's will, we're going to have a target painted on our backs. Peter had a target painted on his back previously. Um, if we look at chapter 22 of Luke, in verses 31 and 32, Christ is coming to Peter, and he's telling him, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So the other thing we're learning is that the prayer, even, even Christ prayed to his father. We see that in multiple occasions. And he's given dominion of the world, so he's there to protect us from Satan. Although there's going to be some challenges he's going to let through for our growth, for our improvement, to show his glory. Um, a perfect example of that, I had mentioned we are now taking, we can take scholarships for the school. Um, it came down to the last two or three hours before the deadline that we got the final paperwork compiled and into them to accept scholarships. So God's there to help us but he's also going to make sure it's clear sometimes it wasn't you, it was me. There's no way you could have gotten that all together in time. So that's the final thing you can take from the uh, denials is that uh, God is there to protect us and watch after us, but occasionally he's going to let Satan through to play with us, to tempt us, to uh, bother us because it's going to be his glory eventually, and it's going to be our growth. Aside from the New Testament, that's not clear anywhere else except in Job. I mean, that's so clear that Job trusted God to the degree that God told the devil, yeah, you can do anything you want, just don't kill him, because I know he's going to continue to worship me. The last thing... I was going to mention it is how Peter died. Um, we don't have a biblical account of his death, so it's all based on church history and tradition. But we do have in John chapter 21 uh, a prophecy Christ made to Peter about his death. He told Peter, Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So Peter was crucified and the church history says he requested not to do it like Christ but to do it upside down because he didn't feel he was worthy to be even killed the same way Christ was. And again, we can't take that to the bank. It's not gospel. But his Christ's prophecy of Peter's death about the outstretched arms is often taken as being... It doesn't contradict the fact that he could have been Christ crucified the way church history says it. It doesn't deny it. Um, again, we can't support it, but it's an interesting historical item just to put on the back. With that, I figure we can close, and I've got you a minute late. Sorry about that. Heavenly Father, thank you for the chance to study your word tonight. Thank you 
for the opportunity to gather with our brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you for all you've done for this church over the years. Thank you for all you've done for our nation. And we ask that you keep blessing our nation as we're in a time of turmoil. And it is through your guidance that we will see right and wrong and how to behave in this time. We ask this all in the name of your Son, Christ Jesus. Yeah.